welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations. We're talking today with Sridhar Gutta. Um, he is the director of India Archive, the preprint repository for India. Welcome, Sridhar. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much for inviting me for this podcast. It's a great pleasure of having you. So um, starting with um, the first question, or it's basically maybe tell us about your research area, why you became interested in open science and open access, and what eventually led you to start a repository like India Archive in the first place? I'm basically a trained um, plant physiologist. Uh, I'm into agriculture research. I joined the agriculture research service in India yeah, way back 2004. So there, um, during that, like my Immediately after one year, I I was attending one conference in Hyderabad, which is on free software. So there I learned about the open journal systems. Then I was thinking, what is this open journal systems, open access? I was not aware that when I went and learned what is exactly this, then I found that, oh, wow, it is, it is like more good. We will be doing it if we embrace this and then... Uh, put all our research into open access online using this software. So I learned about this journal systems, how to install. We started one journal uh, and it, it took some time. Uh, maybe you can say it is like 2006, uh, it started like journal and we were like, we are the first to launch the open access journal in our agriculture research system. So that and see, I want to be show like, uh, you know, we want to make it as an example uh, in our system that you can start your journals online with a free software. So I was learning those and doing the advocacy, connecting with people, uh, seeing how, what is happening around the world, how this movement is going on. Then we thought of having one community to be built in India who talks and then learns and share about open access. So mm -hmm. we founded Open Access India and then it's growing on. So there, and this scholarly ecosystem is changing and uh, preprints have come into like talk. People are discussing about this. And then the Center for Open Science has come up with a uh, launching the co-branded preprint repositories. Mm -hmm. So then we had a talks with them and we got uh, one uh, repository established for agriculture sciences because that was not there. And uh, we want to see how the agriculture community responds to this initiative taken up by the Open Access India. So we started Agri Archive. And then uh, slowly we also went to this India Archive. Now we have the India Archive is relaunched again and the agriculture repository, which is Agri Archive, is now with the CABI International. So we have handed over to them to manage and then take care of it because we were not able to manage the repositories because of many reasons. One of these is the lack of funds. Hmm. Yeah, so as many of of our listeners might know is that preprint publishing of research manuscripts is free of charge for the authors, but of course there is also management and work involved in the handling and the processing of the publishing. And um, yeah, allow like for one's a moderation process, but also the technology, the underlying technology, which is why there's costs that are being incurred. And um, the Center for Open Science started with um, with the budgets ahead and eventually had to um, transfer the costs to the communities for whatever reasons, um, which then also left us also with Africa Archive. We were also struggling and finding a workaround, um, which eventually led us to diversify uh, our portfolio of repositories and yeah, and, and now you are using the, the same system, OGS, but it's specialized by the PKP, the Public Knowledge Project, specialized for preprints only. So now you're using o, o, OPS, right? The Open Preprint System. Like you, yes, you yes, OPS. 
we were waiting for this kind of initiative to be uh, happening and we are lucky enough to that to get the same software which is in uh, almost similar to the OJS workflow and installation also took very less time and uh, I have a friend who Tipaswami who could install it in a one hour in the web server where we were hosting the OJS uh, software for another journal system. So the software is now free and the Society for Promotion of Horticulture is kind enough to host these preprints in their web server. So mm -hmm. that now the costs have been minimized. The only cost which we'll be incurring is to when we go for a DIY and the versions increases, like if version two, three, four for a one record goes and there will be multiple DIYs. So there that cost we have to bear. So we are looking for the uh, the donors or the community all itself to support uh, to uh, pay for that charge. Otherwise, we we I don't think we'll be having much uh, cost to be involved in this. And we have the volunteers who can moderate, uh, and then the we have an advisory committee which advises on how to go about. And we'll be shortly meeting uh, uh, to discuss on these modalities how we can uh, get these funds for the DVOIs. Mm. But, um, so the institution that hosts OPS and with it um, in the archive is also based in India, right? Yes, yes. And that's also what we're aiming for with Africa Archives, just that we are not as far as you are with having a partner institution who's actually willing and um, partnering with us for the hosting. Um, and. I don't know if it would be easy on a country level, but for us, it's on a continental level. And that might seem like an, I don't know, um, an overload in management responsibilities to some institutions, but um, but we are hopeful that we soon find a partner <laughs> and we have a yeah. few candidates yeah. in mind. But this is also super important to us. And I bet also for you to be able to say that the research is being stored, yes, in a cloud, so it's accessible online, but the physical storage is in our country, right? It's like local storage. So it's also a level of data um, sovereignty, data ownership of the research data. Is that important to the community or you as a manager? Is it part of the equation? Yeah, some express something like that. This is our uh, data. This is our information. Uh, how like how can I be uh, like trusting to I means where this my data goes like this? They were some skeptical, but uh, we assured them that this is the physical server which we have here, mm -hmm. and everything is taken care, of and there will not be any problem. But I, I still believe that even if it is physical server or cloud server, it should not be any, any, any issue because now it's a global world and you mm -hmm. have servers. Like it's Physical servers maintenance will be a tedious one and cloud secured servers can uh, make you. And when you are making it open, so you want it open. So let's be a many copies and people copy many of your works and then make it available. Only thing is they should not plagiarize. So mm. when your work is may lots of copies are available, it, it is easy to uh, others to catch all of it. So your work will be more visible when you have more copies. So let's open and let's replicate, uh, let it be replicated, your work be replicated and reach the need or the targets to whom you have made this uh, mm. research uh, I mean, work and you made that scholar article uh, to be read by people so let it be open and preprint repositories are the first repositories where you should deposit uh, and then make it uh, available for others to comment on it the more more comments more review it gets more uh, like you know more standardized work so that that can be a more authenticated work refined work Mm. Yeah, I agree. That is, that's the aim. Say again. That's the aim. Like we want it uh, yeah. refined, you know, like authenticated, refined, or stamped quality. All these things you can add. Adjectives. Yeah, exactly. 
And where researchers have a fear of being scooped for their ideas, um, usually in preprint repositories, there's an open license applied so that authorship is always with the original author. Um, and then also, well, the DOI, which guarantees the long-term storage also online. So all, most of the fears and the reluctances in researchers sharing their manuscripts before they share with the journal um, or publisher are actually redundant because it's already been taken care of. It cannot be scooped. It's rather that they keep the copyright or they keep the ownership of the text. If it's deposited in an open repository like India Archive, and then I can still submit the same article to a journal. Um, which is it the same? I think, um, like, as a matter of fact, when you look at services like um, Sherpa Romeo, which is, um, I think, managed by, well, I think it's Cambridge University. I'm not sure. Please excuse me. Yeah, it's a service. Yes, Edina UK, uh, whether some, like, it Cambridge only, I guess. Yeah. So, but the Sherpa Romeo service allows us to check um, for the open access policies of journals, of particular journals where, where we as researchers want to publish in. And then most, I think it's now about 90% of the journals on this planet really, or that are digitally indexed in the Romeo database, they are positive for preprint sharing and green open access. So, there's no contradiction in having your, your manuscript shared on a preprint repository and then having to fear that the journal would accept it, or rather the opposite. Because then the journal can also be sure that they get a high quality version of a manuscript submitted to. And they can still add value in terms of the formatting, the editorial processes, the peer review on the publisher side. So there's also a meaningful um, value add on the journal side. So this is just to say, because our experiences at Africa Archive are similar to yours, that many researchers fear that the journal would reject because the work is already shared openly. So why would a journal be keen to still accept it? Is that something that, that you have um, conversations about? Yes, yes. Uh, when I when it comes to India, we have like uh, the the more the international publishers are there, okay. But in India, there are many other scholarly societies which are publishing journals, mm. and they are not aware of these kind of policies. Uh, I see very few of the journals from India are indexed in the uh, that policies are indexed in the Sherpa Romeo. Not many have contributed their corporate policies to that. Uh, we sometime back we thought of having one campaign to get all those publishers to register their copyright policies uh, but we didn't take it off i think we should do it that again mm. uh, and uh, when this uh, when people are i, I have not gone to the uh, publisher's website to submit a article recently but i feel that there should be a, i think there should there is i guess that once you submit a article there should be an option to uh, put into the preprint repository, but before that, there uh, the journal itself should come with a policy. See, uh, initially in the checklist itself, that you can uh, submit to a pre, pre as a repository, or there is we don't uh, uh, we have a policy that it is now we will not say it is a pre-published kind of thing. Some should be there in the checklist. Yeah, and then only these authors will know uh, the journals are having a policy towards open access. That should be explicitly mentioned, what I want to say mm. in a summary that journals accept preprints should be there. Like when you when you open a website for a submission of your article, this, this journal website should explicitly say that we welcome preprints. So that, that will help uh, build a trust among the researchers that all the journals accept preprints, but mm -hmm. because not many are aware of it. Yeah, and I believe also that having a connection with a preprint repository, especially an independent one like yours on the national level, um, 
would make the work for the journal and the publisher much easier because then they already have the trust level and the trust buy-in of the research community to the preprint. They get high quality research output, which has been reviewed by hundreds and thousands of researchers possibly has already um, done its rounds of investigation and proofreading. And then as I personally see it, the role of a journal would then to be to curate the content meaningfully in and embed it in a series of publications that they have under their name. And that's what I think where, I don't think any of us is trying to get rid of journal, journals um, altogether. True. They are an important part of the publishing ecosystem. And now with preprints, which in some disciplines have also been around for many decades, like at least for the physics and mathematics with archive.org. Um, it's just a level, another level of um, to speed up conversation. Now also with our urgent and pressing topics, I think the topics like the global topics like now climate change or war, um, conflict studies and um, uh, what else, uh, migration. These have always been of, of urgent interest to many societies or all societies around the world. So, and I personally believe that research has a duty and also the ability to allow us as a global science, um, society to learn from past mistakes, to do better, to to run analysis, like future analysis, um, to be able to weigh options against each other. And that's only possible if we open up our conversations through open access and open publishing. And journals can play an important role in curating the content to make it comprehensible and comparable. Because what preprints do is just to, well, not just, but it's also an important step in the game, is to make it discoverable in the first place. And then the journals, can curate the content into meaningful series of publications. That's how I think we can all work together and everybody wins in the, in the exercise. True, true, true. I, I, this, this uh, what you said is like, we are not going to get rid of journals, publishing houses, which are publishing. What you, uh, that emphasis you are, you are making on the curation is more important. And this part with the preprints part is another, another one wherein that will help people to come out more like meaningful conversation should should be happening uh, with the advent of new technologies in the web and so the communication tools we have earlier the communication was very like you you have to write a mail or like surface normal postal to the mail it has come but now it is real-time conversations happening and that too like at any any corner of the world you can connect and then comment on it so that is the part, the beauty part of this uh, public peer review or the open peer review kind of thing happening. And that too, for the benefit of the, the article itself, uh, the benefit of the research work, you have done it. So that will help us like if, if somebody says that comments on my work uh, for the improvement, I should always welcome and I should be able to answer those questions raised by it. So that will help me in progressing more uh, proper way. And that part, like the journal publication is another part which is taking care. So these, this area needs to be nourished and then the research assessment agencies or the managers or the university officials, the institutional um, cells which are working on the research assessment should take uh, care of this part and the authors also need to be sensitized. Uh, sharing is more caring and uh, this kind of approach will help. No, they're only more helpful than harm. Hmm. Yeah, I uh, totally agree with that. And I think we're looking also towards a bright future. And um, once we align the workflows and embed pre -print, independent preprint um, dissemination into all kinds of publisher and journal based workflows. Um, what, how do you see the open access or the scholarly ecosystem? Are there, you mentioned um, research association in India. Um, so 
is there a level of um, conversation and um, in terms of interoperability while really inter or collaboration on institutional levels that you see um, happening where there's increasing conversations also around open open access and novel publishing pathways is there yeah uh, if i if i talk about the indian situation the open access means uh, more article processing charges mm. so when they equate that to see whenever we say open access they say apcs so and and we cannot afford to pay huge apcs uh, so then this the movement is like getting diluted because of the uh, high when high processing charges being levied by the journals mm. for making it open uh, i i see that many uh, people are going towards it by paying huge APCs, but only because the prestige is attached to that, the impact factor, or to uh, say that my paper is in this journal uh, for the assessment or the promotions. So if that is the criteria that you should publish in those high impact factor journals, and uh, when the researcher wants to be like publishing in a very, short time so the only way is uh, open access uh, way paying the heavy apcs mm. so not all are going i mean getting this chance so whosoever gets chance to pay for the like getting a fund for that so they are well they are well off others are still in the they're waiting the traditional publication to happen waiting for six months to a year mm. for a article to come and show light so this yeah. is the one problem which we are facing uh, open access is being equated to a uh, high apcs yeah it's also what i hear like in europe and when i give courses in germany or in other european countries when i mention open access people either say oh that's too expensive for us so of course I publish open access as if it's only about the money. And then I usually introduce them to the Deutsch, the director of open access journals and point out how many explicitly non-predatory journals there are in a certain niche of research, like in a certain discipline. So I let them search for journals in their, uh, in their scope of, of expertise if they work on climate change and then what particular aspect of climate change. And there is usually at least 10, usually 20 or 30 or 50 journals they can choose. And only one or two of them have high MPCs. Usually the MPCs are zero or just a couple of hundred euros or dollars. And that's when I see, oh, I didn't know this. And that's so unfortunate, like anywhere in the world that open access is now a synonym to expensive publishing. And that's really not what it should be or what it is actually. It's just a matter of raising awareness. And that's also where I see my, um, my role in as a consultant and trainer for open science or science communication generally, um, to point out the alternatives and the options that each of us has and making an informed decision where to publish. And then the other thing that I usually to um, point out is DORA, as of DORA, the Declaration on Research Assessment. Is that also a problem in India that your career depends on where you publish instead of what you publish? Because it's unfortunately, as we know, it's, uh, it's like the biggest misconception in academia these days, or misconception, misbehavior really, like that it's more important that you publish in a prestigious journal rather than making sure that your research is being, is accessible by, the, like you said, in the beginning of our conversation, like you said, the research that we share and disseminate um, should be accessible by, by the people um, we want to reach with our information. Yes, <clears throat> that's true. Like in India, we have the, like there is a, you know, scorecard system. Like if you publish in these journals, you'll get some marks. Mm. They will not look at your work. They will not read your paper. Just because you're publishing in a journal, 
that journal will be given one number i mean some uh, one ranking number that ranking number will be multiplied with some formula and that will give you weightage to your paper so just merely publishing in a journal having some suppose a rating of 6 means it is having a 0.001 impact factor so they will add to 6 to that so 6.001 so when you publish into that paper that journal you will the, your article gets some marks based on some formula so i i would wonder why this has to be like there should be an op, uh, like their the research assessment agencies should ask you you to submit some papers of your choice and then they should go through it mm. instead of like it goes subjective so so they don't they don't want to go and subjective thing they want to be very objective if you publish in this journal you will get these marks because to screen a large people uh, very swiftly they are op- they are opting this uh, way uh, so they some are okay with this some are against some have no opinion but when you ask me so at least for the papers the research work should not be a uh, you know this uh, kind of a marks it should be a more subjective so you should be like the 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 committees should look at your paper and then give some i mean uh, uh, like they should look your work and then give a uh, promotion marks in for that not just publishing in a one journal mm-hmm. and this this is still when this dora declaration is also there not many of the people have signed to that uh, as a agencies individually everybody wants you can see so many indians have signed to that Uh, but uh, the organizations which are funding or which are into the assessment they have not taken any uh, you know uh, means initiative to look at those things uh, still the reforms and research assessment has to be uh, like we have to change a lot into that still only the web of science and scopus only rules okay they are the largest uh, databases but you should not uh, t- say that just to uh, you know publishing in those indexed journals only having author i mean as a prestigious so that tag should not be attached to that mm. you the author is uh, free free to publish anywhere as per his choice but you know you only you are making them to publish only in this uh, journals i'll give one example the one the starting i said i was uh, when i joined we started one journal that journal was the first in the medicinal plants that is a first open access journal and it is indexed by scopus but research is happening on medicinal plants but no author is submitting to that journal why because it is rated very low reasons they as per their uh, criteria it is low low rating so even after review happening those people authors are retract I means taking the article back and publishing other place uh-huh. since 2019 no issue has come up and scopus is asking us uh, whether when the new issue will come because authors are not submitting so no issues are coming uh-huh. so there is that like authors want to publish but they have to look for a place which will help them in promotions so the mere uh, like half of uh, work is now only for the pub- promotions not for the uh, research communications i feel this maybe I, i should be correcting myself in future when i see uh, people are saying no so my research is not for promotion my research is for uh, public good mm, so yeah here, also so it's unfortunately also what i hear when i ask When I, well, I also give courses in scientific writing. When I ask the PhD students, um, especially the second and third year, why we talk about why we why do we write articles? Why do we communicate in a PDF kind of manner? Or why do why do we write research articles? They literally often tell me, "I need this to graduate. I have to publish articles to graduate." it's not like in their minds it's not at a certain stage they lose the idea of of course we want to communicate what we found in our research they only see oh i have to do this otherwise i won't get my 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 title <laughs> like seriously 
And that's when I go like, okay, now can you try again? Because the first try wasn't really good. <laughs> and it's unfortunate to see that already in, at this early career stage that the only reason to write an article is first of all, I have to do this. I'm being told to do this, but they don't see the value of sharing their work. Maybe they also feel insecure about it. They don't feel it's good enough to share at this stage, but they have to, to graduate. So I can see that there is all kinds of components that come into this notion, but it should, I mean, I, I wish for a world where PhD students or any research of any career stage feels happy and motivated to share their results, especially like also if they're negative results or unexpected results. But people are, have become so shy, so reluctant, and like they have to strive for prestigious journals to to in order to be able to pursue their careers. It's it's really sad. Like it feels sometimes it feels as if research has lost its its um, flavor or the beauty that it normally has. I think when we start, and I've also met, well, I know a couple of researchers who have this passion for the research topic they're studying, and they don't bother so much about the publishing aspect. Yes, they're also happy to share, but they don't bother so much. I think you can, at some stage, you can, um, once you achieve a certain rank, then you don't have to bother so much anymore about the prestige part of where you publish. And that's when you can then sit back and, and enjoy your research again. <laughs> the question is, when will this be in your career? And can we not do both? Not, not the prestige part, but can we not be happy as researchers and happily share what we find because everybody wins in sharing. Sharing is caring, but also sharing is also receiving because um, that opens the opportunity for collaboration. Um, there's many examples through open access where researchers gained better results because um, some un other researchers added a data set to the study and they had a better um, result as a consequence by combining their findings. So when did we lose track of these opportunities that the research exercise provides? I don't know if we really lost it, but I like to remind people that there's also that aspect of science. No, like when I was now one journal was there. Now it is not no more on site. It is it still exists, but it's not more on site. It published in a very swiftly. You submit today in two two three days, it is online, and the researcher is in a hurry to submit her his or thesis. And they are looking for a place where to publish because they require two papers to be published before submission. So they were going after those predatory, so-called predatory journals or questionable journals. Mm. That need that can be avoided if if you institutionalize these preprint uh, 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 preprint repositories like uh, submission to the preprints. Mm. That will help. Uh, that no, if they take out this. Uh, one rule that you should publish before submission. Then we can see a good number of uh, publications happening in because they are not in a hurry. They will they will do that. See, you know, writing a article is a it takes a lot of time. Mm. So you should not be in hurriedly writing. I've seen some submission to a journal which I also look after that as a, uh, a manager of this uh, open access software and all these things. So some people, they what they do for this PhD, they just copy uh, the materials and methods and all these things and make it a, some review kind of thing. And I see uh, different uh, formats, you know, those texts are also in different things because they were in hurry to submit. Hmm. So this, maybe they require more training or more uh, institutionalization of this how to write papers in a more meaningful way. So that that capacity building needs to be mm. inculcated. So our U University of Grant Commission, UGC, has made it mandatory to have a uh, some courses on science communication. Still, uh, this part is lacking in many of the universities where 
they don't follow this ugc pattern mm. so that so that capacity building needs to be done yeah i think all around the world there's a need for that so if we just briefly talk about predatory journals because this term like i try and avoid the term as much as i can because i feel it's heavily it's being heavily misused because journals that are being labeled as predatory are often highly dedicated um journal teams editorial teams who are heavily underfunded and they simply don't have the capacity for what some prestigious libraries might consider or journal editorial teams might consider as good publishing practice, but it's still decent, like in many cases where they just don't comply with certain policies of providing peer review. Of course, there's also um, like we've seen there's journals who, who are on the market just to, for the money. And then I'm just putting this out there without mentioning a name like what's what's meant when we talk about predated journals is that there's a claim for an exorbitant fee for very little or no services that the journal is expected to conduct. So why now is it possible that certain journals who are very much prestigious and have crazy APCs article processing charges and then there are I, I don't want to put a number to this but they're rather frequently found to not do a proper peer review or not even do it themselves but coordinate peer review properly and why are those not then labeled also as predatory like I'm, I'm just putting this out here whereas small teams and when running a journal in a heavily underfunded research institute often means that you have one maximum two people in the editorial process so who who do the best they can in providing a platform for research dissemination as we just discussed like people do research it needs to get out to the world i mean why else would the would the taxpayers spend their money on on some people being researchers and doing the work and then they're being called predatory just because they only provide or can organize one of two peer reviews or none, but still the work would be valid research and rigorous. Anyway, so I feel all I'm saying is I feel the term predatory journal um, publishing is often used without really looking behind the curtains, what we're calling out. Um, so therefore, yes, of course, we need quality standards also on the publishing process um, on a service level. And yet again, also here, can we ask for the purpose? Why are we doing this? And do we really need um, a certain level of, I don't know, bureaucracy where the work gets done with less um, investment and less human resource? as in personal, and still there is good quality as a result in research output. And the purpose is to disseminate the research in the first place. And then the assessment can be done at the tutorial level, yes. And if we follow the preprint approach also by the broader research community, and then it's post submission moderation or post submission assessment. And that can also be a model to pursue as long as the research gets out to the public or to other stakeholders. That's just my, my view. Yeah, yeah. correct. Uh, what you said is correct. There is a like the yardstick which they look at and then label it as a predatory or we call it as questionable publishers. Mm -hmm. So it is different. What you said is correct. And many of those good journals are also labeled as, uh, as a predatory. But you know, this uh, cost cutting things can be done through the software, but you know people have to read. Some, some, somehow, some are sitting nights together to write the rewriting the submissions because they don't want to lose the work because it's not all good communicators. So when they write a public paper, mm -hmm. so the it maybe it, it is giving something other meaning. So they will try to put up rewrite and then talk to the uh, author and 
know what they meant it and then they do so some people some journals are doing that kind and it is taking long time to get those articles published so that and then because when it is taking time and some says oh it's too it takes too long time to uh, publish so we have to go <clears throat> together so i uh, means that's why this preprints is an important thing where you can date stamp it get a uh, like priority of your work and then you wait for the publication to happening and uh, as you said the dvoj not many refers to that somebody uh, sends me a message can you suggest me a good journal i said just refer dvoj mm. so that but you know not in india also we have the university grants commission has put up a curated list they only talks about web of science and scopus mm. they they left dvoj there are two lists one list is been curated by the uh ugc uh, appointed um, designated center and the another list is directly taking from the web of science and scopus so we were asking them uh, dvojs should also be included because not all journals are indexed all together in both all these three some are only indexed in dvoj some are in the web of science only some are in scopus at times there are some journals which is having at all these places but a journal which is not there in Uh, web of science and scopus should not be left out because divojs does this curation of uh, bringing quality into that uh, and showing to the world that see these are author- authoritative uh, listed journals mm. and it's a dynamic again it's it's some gets into that some will be uh, coach to uh, change mend their policies or work as per the transparency and guidelines ethics um, and it's like uh, you know some societies which are not having any experience on running a journals needs to be uh, uh, given a support mm. how to publish how to get into publications mm. process uh, so that also needs to be like all every actor needs to be given an important importance and then needs to be given capacity building chance mm. so th- so that that uh, that i wish that journals who are looking to excel should yeah. look up these kind of things i think so yeah I, um that reminds me of corp the committee on publication ethics which I think postulated um policies and standards for good scientific publishing. And I wanted to ask in Africa we have African Journals Online as a database of the African specific African owned journals. Is there I I just found um indianjournals.com which seems to be a corporate platform. But is there mm-hmm. other databases where and in researchers can find indian journals no no what happened is when this open access movement or the online journals were coming up indianjournals.com has come forward and say we would like to give a platform for the journals society journals which uh, i said na in india so there are many societies which run journals so because there are only print only they said we will give a platform online platform and you will your journals get visible so mm-hmm. many people have embraced that uh, platform and many are there and the contract is uh, being renewed or by many journals who doesn't have a uh, you know managing uh, uh, because i said like some of the journals doesn't have a sta- dedicated staff mm. the the people who are in working i mean have to take some time for this journal so they are relying on them on the manuscript submission and then mm. all other editorial process type setting uh, and getting the voice and all those things uh, asian journals we there was there earlier nepal mm. journals african journals but indian journals as such there is no but i will say uh, the from agriculture our council icar has put up a one uh, platform using ojs and it on that around 100 journals are hosted on that so that that is for agriculture only for agriculture mm-hmm. uh, published by the societies and the universities it is it is on ojs 
but not all are on uh, all of the open access journals and not many are indexed in DYJ. So we are now working with them to uh, do the process of submission to the DYJ and getting DYs and how they can uh, archive those uh, their uh, metadata in the crossref mm. and then how they can change the policies from uh, closed access to the open access so what licensing they should be adopting it so mm. that that we are thinking and probably in a couple of months we will be having one workshop on that for those journals which are hosted by icar right. platform yeah it sounds good and I would like to add that America has come up with a non-commercial publishing software where XMLs uh, being used to uh, tag the word process, word uh, word documents and make a other formats HTML, PDF, or XML itself, or mm -hmm. you know other EPUBs. So that also, if we integrate the societies, takes that onto their board and gets trained on that. So the typesetting and all these things will be uh, made easy. And some of the uh, universities have made a LaTeX uh, software for thesis formatting. Mm. So if they also come up with a uh, LaTeX uh, you know, format for the journals also, if they are publishing, those universities, if they publish that, if they do it, so all this can be automated and only the editorial uh, team can more concentrate on the content rather than the typeset or layout. Yeah, exactly. So, like yeah. I, I also personally just learned about this last year, to be honest, that and it's for some reason I haven't asked myself, but very much knowing that the PDF format is not necessarily uh, machine readable or it's actually not accessible for machine reading and AI um, apply, apply but it's not applicable for machine machine reading um, so that I wasn't aware of the XML format but and it's so easy to add so this is also something that we want to embed in our workflow with Africa archive to either ask the authors to submit the manuscripts and data sets in XML. Um, additionally to the PDF format, um, or we convert it for them or both. I mean, whichever is easiest or quickest. It's an extra step, but it improves research integrity on so many levels. I agree. Thanks for pointing this out. Um, and thanks yes. to Amelika, our friends in, <laughs> in Latin America <laughs> for, for pushing the narrative and the the urgency on this. Yes. Great. Um, I think, oh yeah, one last question I wanted to ask you. Obviously English is like the former uh, colonial language in India, but you have many languages um, besides English that people and also researchers speak. So is India archive multilingual? Do you accept works in languages other than India? Uh, sorry, English. Or also like more generally in the Indian scholarly ecosystem um, is non-English publishing a thing? Like is it common to pub publish in? Um... Yes, we, we intend to be a, a multilingual and uh, like all languages, uh, whosoever writes any article in any language will be accepted. And we are recruiting those uh, volunteers or means the committee, the steering committee is from different language backgrounds. So they can read what the article is uh, written in which language. And I'll, I'll say that in DYJ, I did check it, but uh, one Hindi, Hindi journal is also indexed in DYJ. Mm. Hindi, I mean, and uh, I'm seeing there are few, few, I think couple of journals not couple, there are a good number of journals are in Hindi language as well. So apart from English, only Hindi, mm. not other languages have come up because the the audience, if it will be limited when these authors are writing for the other people to read, uh, maybe for the citation or for any other purpose. Mm. So they would like to read write in English only, but being a, a non-native English speaker, so we have a problem in uh, writing in a good English 
so that needs to be sent to a copy editing for before it is finally published so some journals does that one maybe that also they incur for that you know it's copying also it takes a lot of money for that yeah so, yeah i bet and also i i just want to highlight also in this opportunity to share in this episode um that in my experience and also um you're probably also aware that much research is very much cultural contextualized and then you use certain words and phrases in your own language in the cultural settings language which can often not be translated to english and i think the same is also true for the many englishes that that are spoken around the world namely australian british scottish um canadian south african you name it there's many variants of english and what i heard also from native english speakers in my scientific writing courses is that the technical english that is becoming mainstream nowadays especially in the life sciences to publish in has nothing to do with the spoken english or the the narrative english that you would read in um in prose and um novels so it's basically stripped off its cultural context which in some disciplines i would think is a danger to the science communication um because many scientific topics are very much culturally contextualized okay that's a lot of it's a big train of thought but maybe for another episode I, like, yeah, here i would like to mention recently there were some prizes were given to the phd researchers the government of india has asked the researchers to write story out of your research work hmm. and the, you know it's a, it's a big huge prize money Mm. Uh, 1 lakh rupees kind of thing like that so many uh, many entries were there and few were given the prizes top most and uh, they have written in the other language also the technical uh, article uh, thesis language or the art, uh, the pub journal language was been changed to the hindi or the norm uh, uh, soft uh, spoken or understandable english in a story wise narratives have been changed so mm. that is new thing and maybe all will be following it see technical one thing not many will be understanding it mm. and you will not get more people who like to translate your work into the stories but as a author i mean so you as a researcher you all you should be able to do a better so you should also look at the audience which are not in the technical uh, as a uh, research i mean fellow researchers but other public general public who are looking forward to consume the information uh, mm-hmm. which is available because now everybody has a digital gadgets in their uh, hands and some or the other they will be searching browsing if your research is being read uh, written in a good uh, you know the meaningful or understandable sense uh, normal english or the language of your mother tongue or or a popular language of your region mm. that will help uh, the other people to know what kind of research is happening and they would like to uh, means you know myths can be uh, taken away so mm. more science can be built when you communicate properly to the people yeah i think that's also unfortunate development that um especially again in the life sciences that some researchers think um scientific writing is only good if it's very technical and doesn't use much um scientific style or writing style um i think the opposite of this is the case which is also being shared by other scientific writing trainers by the way so i'm not alone with this perception that scientific writing has a purpose in itself in making research results um yeah sharing research results with other people yes other researchers primarily but not only and also researchers who are not in the same laboratory with you will appreciate us and using a rich language be it english german hindi or whichever language but to make it comprehensible and to embed it also in the culture 
that language transmits so that we can understand what the research is actually about. And I love that the fact that in India you have also incentives for researchers to make their work um, understood by yes. non-scientists. And we, with Africa Archive, we are working with an organization called Masakana and another one called Linksys, so science communication organization in South Africa, and then a company that specializes in translation from English to many traditional African languages. And there we thought we would translate research articles one-on-one -on -one from one language, from English to a traditional African language. Turns out that's not possible because the terms are so specific. So we did what you just said, um, the, the prize uh, call for submissions also suggested that we, um, so we have science communicators who translate the research into a lay summary or an extended lay summary to contextualize it and to make it comprehensible. And then we translate that into the African language. And that's much easier and also more useful in the first and so, um, so that's a fun experience. And maybe this is something also as, as or this is basically also what preprint repositories can serve and foster towards multilingualism um, and research, especially in, well, yeah, I think anywhere in the world really, but especially in, in countries and regions where there are so many languages spoken. Because again, what, what's the purpose of research and research communication of only a small number of individuals can actually understand and read the outcome? Or on a more positive end, everybody wins if we make our work accessible, not only through open access, but also through translations. <laughs> yes, yes. And there should be a license uh, for the translation in the sense the translator need not to always approach you. So under open access, it's already been granted for any translations. So mm. that will help take care of it. Yeah, uh, so that's important to have CC BY only and not any other CC BY something, something license. Or some people apply CC BY ND, not derivatives which would exclude translations. So then we cannot, without asking, do a translation of your work. But but yeah, CC BY only would, would perf be perfect for that. And that's also commonly applied in the open access publishing. Yeah, India, India Archive doesn't go for the CC BY. <laughs> it is with the non-commercial share alike to start with is oh. probably we can uh, move to CC BY. But initially when Agri Archive was started, we we went with the CC BY itself. That was a default. And now to just to bring more people on board. So uh, they may think that my work is being commercially uh, used by others. So there are some uh, questions raised by others like, uh, why somebody need, uh, means money with my research? If I license on the CC BY, mm -hmm. uh, so somebody is doing a, getting monetization of my work. So that is happening. So I don't want to go. So to to have those people also be on board. So we have went for this uh, non-commercial and uh, share alike. Mm -hmm. But you know, as we all know that that is not the open. So the open is always is only on the top. That is CC BY. Yeah, but share alike is also problematic for translations now that I come to because or maybe no, maybe it's not. Unless the yeah, share like only refers to the license, right? But non-commercial means especially for translations, because then you actually need translators who are already underpaid um, professionals, yeah. and then they cannot make money with the translational work they do on a manuscript. So yeah, but um yeah, so the, the ecosystem keeps evolving. Um, we're making progress um, with open access and open science more generally. And yeah, um, I would like to, and also to give you again the opportunity to, to share any final remarks. Um, and you're most welcome to come again. And maybe, I don't know, in a couple of weeks or months, we have another topic to discuss here. 
So thank you so much for joining me today. And yeah, any anything else you want to have mentioned before we end? I only want uh, through the who are the listeners or who are means attending means who are who will be getting the opportunity to hear this conversation uh, should uh, think more on the how to open the access. There are ways and means. Uh, like you, for your promotion, you can publish it anywhere because you are the best judge where to publish. But think how it can be made open so that only more good will happen to you, not any harm. So the researchers should be like they should they, they themselves make aware uh, how how good it will be if it is open. So and then I wish that the uh, the India archive will be populated more with multi language uh, uh, articles and that will be the one stop portal of the indian research which we aim for to make it developed to the world and the young researchers will embrace this platform and submit their uh, articles to this so this i just wanted to say thank you so much and speak to you soon again yes thank you very much bye